Welcome to the third installment of our lecture series on the general linear model, and welcome to the sailing vessel O. Today we will learn how to describe differences between two groups using the general linear model. You can use this technique anytime you have a binary predictor variable and a continuous outcome variable. This is a basic extension of the bivariate linear regression model. First of all, let's refresh our knowledge on categorical predictors. Recall that categorical predictors are either nominal or ordinal, and the nominal variable distinguishes between groups that differ only in name, whereas ordinal variables differentiate groups that have a natural order. Now, for the purpose of modeling the difference between two groups, this distinction is arbitrary, but let's nonetheless look at a few examples of nominal and ordinal binary variables. Probably the most commonly used example of a nominal binary variable is biological sex, uh, where we often distinguish male and female participants. Of course, biological sex is not the same as gender, which is a social construct, and there is also some variability in biological sex characteristics, but nonetheless this is a distinction that is often made. Another nominal binary variable could be student ethnicity. This one is a bit artificial, so we are based in the Netherlands, so one category could be Dutch, and another category could be composed of students with any other nationality. So here we distinguish between Dutch and foreign students, where the second group will have somewhat higher heterogeneity. Another example of a nominal binary variable could be whether someone has a tattoo or not, or has pets or not, and these are both yes-no type of variables, those are both binary. And then let's look at a few examples of ordinary binary variables. For example, performance on an exam question is arguably an ordinal binary variable. If you fail, you score a zero. If you pass, you score a one. Another example could be risk of disease, where there is a clear ordinal difference between low and high risk of the disease. So for example, if you don't have a particular genetic marker, then you might have low risk of disease. And if you do have that genetic marker, you might have high risk of the disease. So this is ordinal. There are different ways to code differences between two groups in your data set. So this table shows five different variables that have been coded in different ways. For example, we see that the variable sex has been coded with words, specifically the words man or woman. We see that the variable ethnicity has been coded zero and one. And here I'm going to guess that zero perhaps represents whether someone is Dutch and one represents whether someone is foreign. We see that having a tattoo or not has been coded one and two. So maybe one means no tattoo and two means yes tattoo. And we see that exam has also been graded with words. We see fail, pass, fail, pass, etc. And we see that risk of disease has been coded one and minus one. So maybe minus one means low risk of disease and one means high risk of disease. What all of these variables have in common is that they code for a difference between two groups. But the way in which that difference is encoded in the data differs for each of these variables. If we want to represent the difference between two groups in the general linear model, we have to code all of these variables in the same way. Specifically, we have to code one group as zero and the other group as one. So here we see the same five variables, but they have been recoded so that the only values that occur are zero and one. So here we see that the variable sex has been recoded to sex woman, and a zero indicates if someone is not a woman, and a one indicates if someone is a woman. Same for ethnicity, here we see a zero indicates if someone did not have ethnicity one, and a one indicates if someone did have ethnicity one. The same for tattoo, so here we see that a zero indicates that someone did not score a two on tattoo, and a one indicates that someone did score a two on tattoo. And here we see that exam has been recoded to exam pass, and zero means that someone did not pass, and one means that someone did pass. And the same for risk. Representing the difference between two groups as zeros and ones, where a zero indicates the person is not a member of the group being coded for, and a one indicates that the person is a member of the group being coded for, is called dummy coding. And it is the core technique that you need for representing binary variables in the general linear model. There are other ways of representing binary variables in the general linear model. 
and the students of the major Cognitive Neuroscience will go on to learn more about this, and if you're interested you might just have a look at it yourself as well. So how do we incorporate these dummy variables in our regression model? Let's first refresh our knowledge of linear regression. Recall that linear regression is a basic model that can be further adapted for various purposes. So you've learned that the regression model represents the individual values on outcome variable y as a linear function with intercept a and slope b multiplied by the individual values on predictor x plus individual prediction errors. And until now, we've assumed that the variable x is a continuous predictor, so a variable that could take theoretically any value. And today we examine how we can use the same model to represent binary predictors. So let's have a look at a scatter plot with a binary predictor on the x-axis and a continuous outcome on the y-axis. So you might, for example, imagine that we've recorded participants self-reported sex as 0 and 1, and we've recorded participants shoe size using European shoe sizes. So here we see that for the people who scored 0 on sex, the shoe sizes are distributed around a value of approximately 38 and a half. And for the people who scored a 1 on sex, the shoe size values are distributed around approximately 43 and a half or 43. So what we see here is that there are only two possible values on the x-axis, 0 and 1, and the y-axis is a continuous variable, so we do see spread on the y-axis, but we do not see any spread on the x-axis. We just see people either scored 0 or 1. Now you could imagine drawing a diagonal line through the means of these two groups, and that would look approximately like this. What we see is that that line goes right through the middle of this group and through the middle of this group. And it continues between the two groups and it continues to the right of the rightmost group and it continues to the left of the leftmost group. As we know, the formula for a diagonal regression line is y equals a plus bx, where a and b are coefficients. Specifically, a is the intercept of the regression line and that is the predicted value when the predictor x equals 0. And b is the slope, which tells us how steep the line is, and it also tells us that y increases by b points when x increases by 1 point. When we conduct regression with a binary predictor, we make clever use of the properties of regression analysis to include a binary predictor as a dummy variable. Recall that in dummy coding we assign the value 0 to one of the categories, and we call that the reference category. And we assign the value 1 to the other category. You can either enter your data this way when you create your data set, or you can recode existing variables, replacing the original value with 0 or 1. Using dummy coding, regression analysis will then estimate the mean of the reference category, and test the difference between the two categories. How does this happen? Well, let's have a closer look. Here, we have the same scatter plot with shoe size on the y-axis and sex on the x-axis, where women are coded 0 and men are coded 1. And now I've spread the values out a little bit so that you see that there are multiple people here with similar shoe sizes. So the spread on the x-axis is just artificial. It's a visual aid. So what we see here is that the data for women are distributed around a value of approximately 38 and a half, 39. And we could theoretically draw a bar chart to represent the mean of that group. And then you see that the top of that bar intersects the data cloud. And the same for men. We see that men's shoe size is distributed around approximately 44. Of course, there's some variability. And we could draw a bar chart which would intersect that cloud of data right in the middle where the mean is, and we see that there is a difference between these two means. One is higher than the other. Now, if we were to fit a regression line to these data, it would exactly intersect the mean value of the data for women and the mean value of the data for men. We also see that the point where the regression line intersects the data for women is the intercept of the regression line A, because women are coded as zero. And we also see that if we increase by a step of one on our predictor, 
that our regression line increases by b steps and b corresponds to the mean difference between the mean of men and the mean of women. So our two regression parameters tell us what is the mean value for women and how big is the mean difference between men and women. So let's look at this as a regression formula. The predicted values on the outcome y are equal to some intercept plus a slope times the value of the predictor, where the predictor sex is now coded 0 for women and 1 for men. And if we fill that formula in for women, women all score 0 on the predictor, so we can fill in the formula as a plus b times 0, and anything multiplied by 0 goes to 0, so all that's left for women is a. So if we fill in this formula for women, we get the predicted value y hat sub i is equal to the intercept a. So the predicted shoe size for women is the intercept a. And if we fill this formula in for men, all of the men score 1 on the predictor. So for men, the predicted value is equal to the intercept plus b times 1, and anything multiplied by 1 is just itself, so this simplifies to a plus b. So the predicted shoe size for men is the intercept a plus the difference between men and women, b, a plus b. Let's look at some output of a regression analysis to see what this looks like. So here we conducted the regression analysis with a dummy variable coding for whether someone is a man or not, and the outcome variable, what is your shoe size? So let's walk through the output. We see that the explained variance is 0.71, 71%. That corresponds to a correlation coefficient of 0.85. And because we are now looking at the correlation between a continuous and a binary variable, this is called the point by serial correlation. We receive an F-test that tells us whether this regression model explains significant variance in the outcome. The f value is equal to 440.04 with 1,176 degrees of freedom and that corresponds to a p-value smaller than 0.001. So the model explains significant variance in the outcome. We also obtain coefficients of the regression equation. So the predicted shoe size is equal to the intercept 38.34 plus 5.20 multiplied by the dummy that codes for whether someone is a man or not. So the intercept is 38.34 and the slope is 5.20 and we also get tests for these two coefficients. So the first test in this case is not that interesting. It tests the null hypothesis that the intercept is equal to zero. But how informative is a null hypothesis that women's shoe size is equal to zero? It's very unlikely, so unsurprisingly the t-value here is very large and this p-value is very small, so we reject that null hypothesis, which makes total sense to me, because shoe sizes don't even go that low. More interesting is the difference between men and women. So the difference between men and women is 5.2 shoe sizes. We have here a standard error for that difference. If we divide the observed difference by its standard error, we get a t-value, and that is also a very large t-value, 20.98 with 176 degrees of freedom, gives us a p-value smaller than 0.001. In other words, there is a significant difference in shoe sizes between men and women of 5.20 with t equal to 20.98, on 176 degrees of freedom and p-value smaller than 0 0.001. So based on what you've learned about linear regression until now, these results should make perfect sense to you. I've explained how you can describe the difference between two groups using the general linear model. And this type of analysis is also called the independent samples t-test. Mathematically, the two analyses are completely identical, but for historical reasons, it's common to find distinct user interfaces to compare two groups using the general linear model or using the independent samples t-test. Now, just to make sure that you can interpret the output from both interfaces to the same analysis,
We'll now devote a little bit of time to the independent samples t-test as a special case of the general linear model. The independent samples t-test is used to compare the means of two independent groups, just like regression with a dummy variable. And in fact, it is known that the independent samples t-test is equivalent to the t-test of the slope in regression with a binary dummy as a predictor. So most statistical programs have a separate interface to conduct an independent samples t-test to compare the means of two groups. And in this case, we look at the results of such an independent samples t-test using the SPSS software. So here we're still looking at the outcome variable, what is your shoe size? And we still have this dummy variable as a predictor, whether someone is not a man or is a man. We get our sample size and we see the two means of the two groups. The group of women scored 38.34 and the group of men scored 43.54. If we then look at the results of the independent samples t-test, we see a t-value of 20.98 on 176 degrees of freedom with a p-value smaller than 0 0.001 and a mean difference of 5.20. In this case, it's a negative value, but that just depends on the order in which these two groups are entered. So whether this is a positive difference or a negative difference actually doesn't really matter, as long as it's clear to you which group had which mean. So let's compare these results to the results from the regression analysis. Focus on the t-value, the degrees of freedom, the mean difference, and the mean value of women. We see here that the mean value of women is represented by the constant. We see here that the mean difference between the two groups is represented by the slope of the regression equation. And we see that the t-test for that slope is exactly identical to the independent samples t-test t-value, as is its p-value, as is the degrees of freedom that we use. In other words, the independent samples t-test interface gives us exactly the same results as regression with a dummy. They are, in fact, mathematically identical. The only difference is that the output for the independent samples t-test is presented in a way that is slightly more conducive for testing differences between two groups. So we could say that the independent samples t-test is a special case of the general linear model. And here we get some extra output, specifically we get the sample size for both groups, we get the means for both groups, we get the standard deviation of those means, the standard error of those means, and we get something here called Levine's test for equality of variance, which is effectively testing the assumption of homoscedasticity when we have a binary predictor. Let's have a look at the assumptions of the independent samples t-test. As I've argued, the independent samples t-test is just linear regression, so it stands to reason that it has the same assumptions as bivariate linear regression, but with some slight nuances because we now assume that the predictor is binary. For example, the assumption of linearity of the relationship between the predictor and the outcome still applies, but because now our predictor only has two values, the difference between those two groups is linear by definition because the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. If you look here at what a scatter plot looks like, it makes no sense to fit any kind of curved line to describe the differences between this point here and this point here. That difference is always, by definition, a straight line. So in practice, this means that we can ignore the assumption of linearity when we're just using a binary predictor. The second assumption relates to normality of residuals, and in fact we still assume that the residuals of the regression equation are normally distributed, but if our predictor only has two values, this assumption is the same as saying that we assume that the outcome is normally distributed within each group. The third assumption is that of homoscedasticity, specifically that our variances are equal. And in this case, that assumption simplifies to assuming that the variances of both groups are equal. Now, previously you learned to test homoscedasticity just by looking at a plot of the residuals. But when we are only comparing two groups, it's much easier to test for homoscedasticity because we can literally perform a difference test on the variances in those two groups. 
You've previously learned about a test to compare two sources of variance, that was an F-test, and in fact we can also do an F-test to compare the variances of two groups in a two-sample T-test. And that test is called Levine's test. So Levine's test tests the assumption of homoscedasticity. And finally, we are still assuming independence of observations. Recall that we discussed a few examples where the assumption of independence of observations was violated. So, for example, if you're trying to test for sex differences between men and women, but you collect data from married couples, then this assumption of independence of observations is violated. Hopefully, you've noticed that the only major difference between how we can check assumptions for regression in general versus for the independent samples t-test specifically, is the way that we can check for homoscedasticity. If we have a binary predictor, we can simply test for homoscedasticity using an f-test, and we call that f-test Levine's test. And in fact, SPSS tests this assumption of homoscedasticity by default when we compare two groups using the interface for the independent samples t-test. So Levine's test is an F-test, as there are two sources of variance, specifically the variance of the one group and of the other group, which are being compared. And the null hypothesis of this comparison is that the variance of group 1 is equal to the variance of group 2. And this is equivalent to saying that the null hypothesis is that the difference between the variance of group 1 and group 2 is equal to 0. If Levine's test is significant, then there is evidence that the two variances are not equal. So this can provide evidence of a violation of that assumption. SPSS does offer you a test that is robust to unequal variances, so this can be used when the assumption of homoscedasticity is violated. But I want you to think carefully before switching to a robust test, because recall that we can never know for sure if the assumptions are true or false in the population. We can only test for evidence of violations in our sample. And if we blindly adjust our analyses to apparent violations of assumptions, then we risk overfitting the data. So perhaps it's better to make an informed guess about whether the variances in the two groups are equal or not, and then stick with that guess. And if you find evidence of a violation of assumptions, report and discuss that in your paper. So what does violation of homoscedasticity look like for an independent samples t-test? Well, here we have some idealized data for two groups. We have a red group and a blue group. And we see that this here is the mean of the red group, and this here is the mean of the blue group, and there is some kind of mean difference. But this Levine's test is only testing the difference between the variances of the red group and the blue group. So it is hopefully visually apparent that in this case their variances are equal. And if I increase the mean difference between the two groups, nothing changes about the value of Levine's test. But if I start making the variance of one of the groups smaller, for example, then we see that Levine's test becomes significant. So here we see that one group has a small variance, so its distribution is quite narrow and peaked. And the blue group has a larger variance, so its distribution is quite flat and spread out. And we see now that Levine's test for equality of variances has become significant. And for educational purposes, we could make the difference even bigger. So now we're making the distribution of the second group, the blue group, even wider. And we see that its distribution becomes very flat and very spread out. And we have a highly significant Levine's test now. So what are the steps if we want to perform an independent samples t-test? Well, the first step is to formulate your hypotheses. The default hypothesis in most software is that H null is that the mean of group one is equal to the mean of group two in the population. And this hypothesis is equivalent to saying that the null hypothesis is that the difference between those two means is equal to zero and we get the difference by subtracting one from the other. The implicit alternative hypothesis here is that the difference between the two groups is not equal to zero. So this is an example of a two-sided hypothesis, but of course it's also possible to conduct a one-sided test, 
For example, our null hypothesis could be that the mean of group 1 is larger than the mean of group 2, which is equivalent to saying that the difference between the mean of group 1 and the mean of group 2 is larger than 0, where we subtract the mean of group 2 from the mean of group 1. And the implicit alternative hypothesis here is that the difference is smaller than or equal to 0. And recall that every time we conduct a one-sided test, our true belief is encompassed by the alternative hypothesis. So in this case, we think that the difference between these two groups is smaller than zero. So the null hypothesis, which we're trying to reject, is that the difference is larger than zero. But we can also conduct any kind of custom hypothesis about a specific mean difference. So we don't always have to test against the zero value. Step two is to calculate the test statistic. To calculate the test statistic, we take the observed group difference minus the hypothesized group difference and divide that by the appropriate standard error. So the observed group difference is simply the difference between the observed group means. So the mean of group one minus the mean of group two. And from this observed group difference, we subtract the hypothesized group difference under the null hypothesis. In this case, we've been testing zero null hypotheses. So this hypothesized group difference is zero. So then we get the observed difference minus zero is just the observed difference. And we divide that by the standard error of the group difference. This is not part of the course material, but technically we can get the standard error for that group difference by taking the square root of the pooled variance of these groups multiplied by one over the size of the first group plus one over the size of the second group. And we get the pooled variance here by taking n minus one times the variance of the first group plus n minus one times the variance of the second group. And these n's are the specific group sizes. So what we're doing here is we are reconstituting the sum of squares for both of these groups, because recall that the variance is just the sum of squares divided by n minus one. So if we multiply the variance by n minus one, we get the sum of squares here, plus the sum of squares here. And we're dividing that by the total size of the two groups minus two. So in fact, we're just reconstituting the sum of squares for this group, plus the sum of squares for this group, dividing by their total degrees of freedom and getting a pooled variance for both of those groups. In other words, the standard error for a t-test is very similar to the standard error for a mean, but it is based on the pooled standard deviation for those two groups. The third step is that we use the t-value that we just calculated and the standard error that we obtained with the appropriate degrees of freedom to find a p-value for this test. And of course, given the name, we are using the t-distribution to find our p-value. So in this case, the degrees of freedom is the sample size of group one plus the sample size of group two minus two. And the reason that we are subtracting two from the degrees of freedom here is because we are estimating two parameters. And those parameters are the intercept A and the slope B, if we are using regression. Or you can think of this as the two means of the two groups, x1 and x2. As I've shown you in previous lectures, you can find that p-value in the t-table, or using an online calculator, or using Excel, or you can just take it from the SPSS output for regression or independent samples t-test. Remember that you have to decide whether or not you assume equal variances, because if you use the interface for the independent samples t-test, you always get a standard t-test and a t-test that is robust against violation of this assumption. The final step is that you draw a conclusion. If your p-value is smaller than the alpha or significance level, you conclude that the test is significant. That means that it's very unlikely to observe a group difference at least as large as you observed if the null hypothesis were true. The final topic for today is the effect size in the case of an independent samples t-test. The effect size tells us something about how large the difference between the two groups is in some meaningful units. So the significance of the t-test tells us whether the difference between groups is statistically significant, but that does not tell us whether it's relevant or practically significant. 
Recall this concept of statistical power. If our sample is large enough, then even trivial differences between groups become significant. So if we have a sample of 100,000 people, then even tiny differences between groups tend to become statistically significant. What effect size measures do is they standardize the difference between group means and make them interpretable on a meaningful scale. For example, on the scale of standard deviation. Let me visualize that for you. So here on the left, we have a stylized distribution of the scores of group one. And here we have the stylized distribution of scores of group two. And we see that the difference between these two groups has a size of three points. If our sample size is large enough, then that difference is going to be significant. But how meaningful is that difference? To answer that question, we can calculate the effect size known as Cohen's D. Cohen's D is an effect size for mean differences, and it's calculated by dividing the mean difference by the pooled standard deviation. How do we interpret Cohen's D? Well, we say that larger values of Cohen's D indicate bigger differences between the two groups. As a rule of thumb, we can say that something has a small effect size if Cohen's D is around 0.2. So if the mean difference is about one-fifth of a standard deviation, we can say that something has a medium effect size if Cohen's D is around 0.5. So if the mean difference is about a half standard deviation, and we can say that something has a large effect size if Cohen's D is around 0.8. So if it's about four-fifths of a standard deviation. But irrespective of rules of thumb, Cohen's D just tells us how big is the difference between these two groups in standard deviations. That's all of the material we'll cover this week. I'm going to make the crossing to the islands you see behind me. Good luck in the tutorials and see you again next week.